Okay, today's session is part of the academic webinar series, which shines the spotlight on the academic community. In this webinar, we're gonna be introducing new educational resources that we've been working on for both instructors and students to use to teach and learn real world applications of problems that combine data science and optimization. We're thrilled to have our data science team joining us. They're gonna be leading us through the incredible library of notebooks that we've made available as open education tools. First, Jerry is our head of data science strategy at Grobe. He brings over 10 years of experience applying operations research, machine learning, statistics, and data visualization to improve decision-making. Jerry's worked as a data scientist for Booz Allen and as a senior consultant for On Location Inc. He also has several years of experience teaching a wide variety of college-level math and stats courses and has a passion for education. Jerry holds BS, education, and MS degrees in mathematics from Ohio University, and he holds an MS in Operations Research and Statistics from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Next, we have Rahul Swamy. Rahul is a PhD candidate in Industrial Engineering at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He's working on fairness-optimized political redistricting. Rahul's passionate about the intersection between operations research and data science. His research has been published in journals such as Operations Research and the Informs Journal on Optimization. We're so excited to have both of them lead us through today's session. And now I'm gonna pass things over to Jerry to kick off the webinar. All right, thanks, Lindsay. Uh, I appreciate the, the nice introduction. Uh, hello, everyone, I'm Jerry Urchison. Uh, and uh, as Lindsay mentioned, we have a great example uh, uh, a set of example notebooks. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what you can find in there and what some what they're useful for. So um, if you head over to our example uh, library set, you're going to see a lot of um, introductory examples all the way up to advanced examples. So no matter where you are in your sort of stage of learning optimization, uh, you'll find the you'll find examples at the right level for you to challenge you and and to expand your knowledge. We also try and hit on key features of Groby and our Python API. So there's a lot of real interesting things that that uh, that our API can do um, with Groby, and we try and highlight those so everyone can get the most uh, sort of most bang for their buck with uh, using Groby. We also cover new uh, have examples that cover numerous industries. So we're all over the place, and I'll hit on that more in in a little bit. So no matter what your interest is in terms of research or or where you may be working, there's something you can find uh, that's applicable to you. And this is a great way to experiment and learn with mathematical optimization. So these notebooks are we we have a lot of direction, a lot of of um, ability to sort of guide you through these things. But you you can definitely expand and and test things and and really have a lot of fun in these. And and we definitely uh, want you to experiment with this to to improve your knowledge. And this can help you find uh, inspiration for any projects that you're working on. So uh, some of the examples that we have are specifically sort of tailored to the data science community. Uh, we have examples about building optimal fantasy basketball lineups, uh, the price optimization, which we're going to hit on uh, a little bit again today, but was part of our first um, uh, data meets decision webinar, along with a music recommendation system. Um, also applications on renewables, renewable scheduling, airline disruption, and text similarity. Those are two that you may be finding a little bit more about later today. Um, those are some of our data science focused examples, but we also have, uh, you know, through our full example library, a lot of examples that span a lot of different industries and use cases. So telecom, logistics, energy, uh, financial services, again, anything that you're interested in, there's probably going to be an example that, uh, that'll uh, pique your interest there. So uh, part of why we have this series is to talk about uh, how predictive modeling, predictive analytics, and prescriptive analytics can work together. So this is a visualization you may have seen a lot, um, uh, some form of it, um, where it talks about you know an, sort of an analytical maturity curve. And uh, a lot of you as data scientists work a lot in the predictive analytics space where you're trying to answer questions about what will happen next. So where you know, where a mathematical optimization sits is in the prescriptive uh, analytics uh, realm, it, where we try and help you sort of uh, take those predictions and get the most out of it by creating an actionable plan uh, using things like forecasts that you may generate with uh, prescriptive analytics. 
but you may be thinking, well, I'm not super, you know, I'm not super data scientist yet, or, you know, that's not, you know, that's not my main function, you know, uh, it, for my role or, or what I'm studying. Um, can I still use optimization? And the answer to that is yes. You know, we sort of have this whole curve there of descriptive analytics, diagnostic, and all the things that sort of tend to lead into predictive. But you don't necessarily need to sort of follow this. This isn't a flow chart. You can you can use optimization even if you're just someone who who works um, in descriptive analytics or even something that's like uh, along diagnostics as well. If you're not fully into the the, the prescriptive analytics um, as part of your day job or or what you're learning uh, in in school right now, so optimization can be applied anywhere along this. So you may be thinking, okay, well. Op mathematical optimization sounds great, but how do I how do I know when it's the right tool? So I'm going to go very quickly through an introduction to mathematical optimization and sort of what you're looking for and uh, to understand um, if it's the right tool to solve your problem. So mathematical optimization essentially is a good approach um, to solving complex decision problems that have a, have um, some common characteristics. One, you want to find the best course of action where the optimization comes in. Two, uh, there's many possibilities. So you're not just choosing the best out of, say, five things. It could be millions or billions or trillions of possible uh, possibilities. Um, these are things, you know, you're, among these possibilities, there are decisions that you can set or some decision maker can set. So you actually have control over things. Uh, there are given uh, specified limitations as well. So you, you can't just pick the absolute, you know, you can't spend all of the money in the world for, for like a marketing budget, let's say. And you have some particular objectives in mind. So you want to, you know, maximize something or minimize something uh, in as part of what you're looking, you know, as part of what your uh, decision problem uh, entails. And also you're interested in something that guarantees a feasible solution and guarantees optimality as well. If those are things that interest you, then mathematical optimization uh, could be the right tool. So essentially what then, once you sort of see that you have a decision problem that sort of checks these boxes, how do you take a decision problem and translate it to an optimization model? Well, there is a little bit of math involved. Um, so we do what we call make a mathematical formulation. It's really not all that complicated. Um, it's just taking your decision problem and translating it into sort of expressions and inequalities um, and things like that. So this is a generic form of a very simple optimization model. Um, but they have three sort of uh, main character or three uh, main components. One is decision variables. So it's the decision that the decision maker can set. And these come in a couple of flavors. One is uh, what we call quantities. So um, something that's like uh, the price of produce um, is, is a quantity of uh, a, a, you know, that type of decision variable and also integer. Um, so we have continuous, which I just described, and then an integer decision variable is something that has to have, you know, something that is either one, two, three, four, so on and so forth. So if you're thinking along the lines of like, uh, you want to optimize something that is manufacturing cars, making half of a car isn't really, you know, doesn't make too much sense. So you may have to have that integral uh, integrality as, as part of your decision variables, and you can sort of specify that in an optimization model. Um, another flavor of decision variable is what we call an alternative. So these are typically modeled using binary uh, decision variables. So it's sort of like a yes, no, although um, mathematically it's a zero one, but uh, that may be a yes, no decision to use an aircraft for a given flight, which may be sort of what we will uh, or who will be talking about a little bit later on. I don't want to spoil too much though. So uh, that's our decision variables. The next part is the specified limitations, which we call constraints in an optimization model. So it's essentially how your expressions relate to some um, to some value. So you can't, you know, you have a limit on your budget, or um, or you know, maybe a limit on the amount of hours that workers can um, work during a given week. Things like that. Those provide constraints for your problem. And then you have a particular objective in mind. So you want to maximize um, revenue, minimize costs, things like that. So once you have that sort of figured out. Um, you then add in Garobi uh, or, and your favorite programming language, and that's how you create an optimization model. So uh, that was my quick introduction. So um, over to you, Rahul. Thank you, Jerry, for the wonderful introduction to mathematical optimization. Um, for the next 25 minutes, I'll be going over uh, two new notebooks that we're introducing to the data science library. 
So these are notebooks that uh, you as an academic could be uh, using in your classrooms or use a data scientist could be using to um, educate and learn more about optimization or you as an operations researcher could be looking at new use cases for integrating um, how real data can be used for uh, mathematical optimization. So the first notebook we're looking at is on flight planning after a weather disruption. Um, as you would know, especially if you lived in the northern part of the hemisphere of the world, like there's been a lot of flight disruptions this year due to weather events. So as an aviation planner, how can you optimally replan your decision making? So this is like a small example that we're looking at. The second notebook is on detecting text similarity. So if you have two documents um, that, uh, that could be semantically similar, can optimization detect whether those two texts are similar? All right, so this year uh, we've had close to a billion dollars of revenue losses for aviation companies due to a lot of uh, flight cancellations. And if you've ever taken a, fl a flight, you would know how harrowing it is when flights get delayed or canceled. Um, these are just some of the headlines from the last one month. And this is a global phenomenon. And uh, every year there's cancellations, right? So um, putting yourself in the shoes of an aviation planner, uh, what, what are some things you can do, right? So what happens during a weather event? is that the airport's capacities are diminished, right? So uh, usually when you have a set of airplane, uh, set of flights landing and taking off, um, that number of takeoffs and landings goes down, right? So that's given at the airport level. And let's say you are in charge of running the airline operations for a big um, commercial airliner across a whole country, and you have a whole fleet of um, uh, aircrafts that are flying around and servicing different flights across different airports and you have a plan for the day and knowing that there's going to be a disruption at the airports, how can you replan, right? And so put, uh, looking at this problem through the lens of optimization, the questions we want to ask are what are the key decisions that we can take, right? So one, one key decision is uh, which flights to cancel, because there's definitely going to be uh, some cancellations. You cannot reservice, uh, you cannot service the whole uh, flight plan, right? And how do you ensure that the aircrafts return to where they need to be for next day's operations so that the cancellations do not propagate to the next day, right? So these are, uh, this is like one of the key questions. And the other is uh, what routes should the aircraft take knowing that the flights some flights have been canceled, right? So you start with the existing plan and the idea is uh, which subset of these flights can we delete from the plan given that the airport capacities have diminished, right? So this is, uh, this is, this is a kind of modeling that we look at an optimization problem where you have an objective that you wanna optimize. In this case, we want to minimize the loss from revenue loss from the canceled flights, right? We want to pick flights to cancel in a way that minimizes this objective while also ensuring that um, the decision variables uh, which we look at are satisfy some of the feasible criteria that we set. And for this, we use real data from France. And this, was, this data was available as part of the 2009 Road of Challenge. So yeah, so let's dive right into the notebook. So when you click the link in the chat, you will be directed to this landing page. So if you scroll down and click this link, you will access the notebook. So in this notebook, we'll be walking through how to model a problem like this uh, using optimization, how to model objective, uh, the variables and the constraints. So these are the three parts to an optimization model. So first let's look at the data, right? So what we have is um, a flight plan. Okay? So we have about 608 flights. And uh, for each flight, we know 
um, what aircraft currently services it, and uh, what are the origin destination um, airports. So here, for example, flight number one goes from Charles de Gaulle to Orly. And what is the start time and what's the end time? So this goes from midnight to midnight, 30 minutes, and so on. So we have about 608 flights currently planned, but some of the air, so but the airport's capacities have diminished, right? So how do we cancel these flights, some of these flights, and which flights to cancel? And these aircrafts, what's the new route? So this is a, it's a very complex problem, but uh, once you put this together in a mathematical optimization format, um, we are able to find optimal decisions. So yeah, so this is a full data set. So just for the illustration, we'll just pick a smaller data set, which is four airports. And uh, for example, we can visualize how this uh, network looks like. So what we have here is what's called a hairball network because of how aesthetically <laughs> pleasing it looks. So the, every arrow is a flight that's currently planned across the four airports over here. So as you can see, uh, it's not easy to do by hand. It's not easy to say, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's what's called combinatorial, meaning uh, there's some combination of flights that would give us the optimal output. And making a decision like this is where optimiz mathematical optimization would be the most handy, okay? So yeah, we, uh, we load the data sets. We also load uh, information on where each aircraft aircraft should start the day and end the day. <clears throat> and we also know passenger itineraries. So for each flight, we know how many passengers are taking the flight and we know the cost of a seat, right? So for example, flight 4296 has so many passengers with different uh, tickets that they bought. So we can find the total revenue brought in by each flight, right? So this, we have this information as well. So all of this data comes from real uh, uh, case study from 2009. And based on this information, we can construct a directed acyclic graph for each aircraft. So this is a pre-processing stage we use for our optimization model. So the idea is to create, um, to store all the possible flight routes for each aircraft. And uh, a flight route is feasible if, uh, if it satisfies two conditions. So let me explain what this flight route means. So what you have here is a graph for um, this aircraft, Airbus 318 number four, right? So this can serve in the current plan, it can serve all of these flights, 3064, 3069, and so on. And it ends at, at the end of the day, it, it returns to where it needs to be so that the next day's operations don't get uh, disrupted. So in this plan, um, every there's an arrow whenever, uh, you know, this, for example, uh, 3064, the destination of that airport corresponds to the arrival airport of 3069. And also the end time of 3064 uh, is before the start time of the next flight, 3069, right? So these are some feasible criteria we can fix to construct feasible transitions from one flight to another. And the, the goal is to find out, okay, which uh, path should this aircraft take such that it starts from where it starts and ends at where it needs to end, right? So we construct a similar graph for every aircraft. And we have this for about 20 aircrafts, right? And yeah, so these are all the inputs to the model. So let's start modeling the optimization problem. Um, so the idea is to, so we have a set of airports, aircrafts and flights, right? And we have uh, some aircraft servicing some flights. Uh, so the key decision here is uh, which aircraft should serve uh, which flight, right? So this variable XAF is one, if flight F is getting serviced, if it's zero, it means that uh, flight F is getting canceled, right? So our objective is to minimize the, the loss from canceled flights. So if XAF is one, it means that it's serviced. And if it's zero, it means that it's canceled. So one minus XAF is one if flight F is canceled. So one minus XAF times RF, which is a revenue from flight F, 
is their revenue, lost revenue from canceling that flight, right? So if you add all the aircrafts and all the flights that the aircraft can, uh, can service, then we get the total revenue loss from the canceled flights, right? So the idea is to write an objective function in terms of the decision variables. And in our case, the decision variable is a binary decision variable. You can take the value zero and one, you can think of it as an on off switch. And uh, yeah, so all we have to do is uh, we create a Groby model, right? So we say, uh, we import Groby Pi and we say, create the model. And we just say, um, set objective. And we just write the objective function using a quick sum, which is just a couple of for loops. And yeah, we just add it to the model, okay? And similarly, we also add the variables. So we have add bar function to add these variables. Um, yeah, so the other variable is the routing variable, which is the yaf1f2, which is which takes the value one if aircraft A goes from flight f1 to f2 immediately. So for every transition flight transition f1, f2, we can create such a variable. So remember those arcs that I showed in the directed acyclic graph, uh, we create each variable for each of those arcs. And if a flight takes a particular path through that arc, then that value is one, right? So the second set of variables help us uh, decide on the optimal route. So then the third part of the optimization model is writing the constraints. So the first set of constraints is what's called flow balance constraints. And these are popular like in famous problems like shortest path, flow problems, traveling salesman. So the idea is to basically start from start sending a, something called flow from the source of each aircraft, that is where it starts. And um, for every intermediate flight, the number of arcs that go in is equal to the number of arcs that go out. And this is, uh, this is classically also, uh, I mean, analogically, you can look at it uh, from a fluid dynamics perspective, whatever comes in goes out. And uh, yeah, so these setting these constraints ensure that there's uh, no flight is getting repeated or no flight is, um, you know, there are no cycles and stuff. So, yeah. So you basically add these constraints um, using the add construct uh, function to the Groby model. And the next set of constraints deals with ensuring that when a flight is um, not a part of the path, then it is not serviced, right? So if this right-hand side is zero, that is flight F is not traversed by the aircraft, then XAF becomes zero as well. So this is an inequality that ensures this relationship between the service variables and the path variables, right? So this is a kind of um, modeling magic that you can use to ensure these kind of relationships between the variables can happen. And if you're an expert in optimization, this is probably one of the basic uh, things you learn in your optimization course. And the third set of uh, constraints we have is the capacity diminished constraints where every airport can only service a reduced amount alpha uh, percentage of the number of aircrafts it used to. For example, if alpha is one, then, then you can have all the flights landing and taking off. If alpha is zero, then it's a complete shutdown of all the airports. So if alpha is 50%, then we have 50% of the landings and take, uh, you know, takeoffs to be serviced. So we also set these as inequalities to the model. And that's pretty much it. We have done building the model and we can say, well, Groby optimizes for me. And yeah, it takes about 0.13 seconds to optimize. This is in Google Colab. Uh, if, if you're running it in a more powerful machine, even a Mac machine, it's usually faster. Um, yeah, so it says the you can query the objective value, the net loss. So it says we for fifty percent diminished capacity at the airports, we have a loss of 0.8 million dollars, and we use we serve fifty of the aircrafts, and we have transported five thousand six hundred forty-one people using ten aircrafts, right? So this is for the one kit scenario where we have fifty percent disruption. Let's say you have a prediction technology that could predict, okay, tomorrow, based on the weather information, we
we expect different scenarios of, uh, you know, you have a probabilistic model on how much disruption can happen. So what you can do is you can put the whole optimization model within a, within a function and you can use the disruption level as a parameter. So what we have here is an interactive tool where the slider gives the percentage of disruption. So for example, zero means that it's a complete shutdown and you make like none of the flights are getting uh, serviced. When we have a 5% disruption, you um, only five, so there is only 5% of the aircraft, like landings and takeoffs can happen. You can only service one flight, uh, sorry. Yeah, two flights with just one aircraft between uh, Nice and Charles de Gaulle. And if you keep increasing the uh, disruption level, so that is you, you have less and less disruption, you make uh, less and less loss, and you can service more flights. Here, the graph shows uh, all the flights color coded by the number the aircrafts used. Right. So if you, if I slide this all the way to uh, all the way up, then uh, you can see that the loss goes down, and we start to service all the flights that we started out with. Right. So, um, yeah. So this is just a small example that could be a starting point for some more complex realism that you can handle. For example, I've added some extensions here. Um, for example, there's issues of crew scheduling, where if some crew misses a flight, they may not be able to service the next future flights, right? So these are more complex information that you can add to the model. Um, like there could be other costs to the flight operations. So uh, yeah, you can start this model and um, investigate how you can build a more complex model with a commercial Groby license, for instance. Right. So in the next part, uh, we'll be looking at a completely different example. So this is a this is a fun um, example motivated by recent uh, progress in text generation technology. So the question we'll be looking at is. Um, given two texts, right? So let's say we, we have two documents. We want to know how dissimilar they are, right? We want to put a number to or a score to how close they are semantically, right? So here, for example, you have two documents. First one is uh, says, Obama speaks to the media in Illinois. The second document says, the president greets the press in Chicago, right? So to a human eye, these two seem similar, like some of the words have semantic closeness to a few other words, like speaks and greets are close, media and press are close, right? Illinois and Chicago are close. Um, so how do we do this using optimization? And what, what are we optimizing for, right? So the idea is to first represent each word as a vector. And the question is, how can we find the smallest way to move the words in one document to the other document. And this kind of movement is an abstract concept that we'll model as a flow problem that similar to the aircraft movement, right? So, uh, so this is a classical problem called a transportation problem. And we're gonna use this to model how to capture the semantic distance between two documents. And this is uh, famously called the word movers distance. And in this example, we'll walk through how to model the word movers distance or the transportation problem using a linear program. So in the notebook I will walk through, we'll be looking at uh, two different goals. And the first part we look at, okay, so given two documents, how can you build an optimization model to find the text similarity or dissimilarity? And in the second part, we'll, uh, we'll start from a plagiarized passage and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll plagiarize one sentence from a book and then we'll see if if the score helps us identify the correct passage that this passage is plagiarized from. And for this, uh, we'll use the, the famous book, The Adventures of uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes. And so the, the, the first or the true data scientist as one might say. And uh, yeah, and uh, to create these alternative passages, we'll use ChatGPT, uh, a famous and popular uh, 
text generation service that's on all of our LinkedIn's right now. So once again, when you click um, the link to the collab, you'll be directed to this landing page. And if you scroll down and click this link, you'll be directed to the, the collab right here. So yeah, so in this notebook, uh, there's, there's a lot of text that walks you through uh, how to run this model and stuff. So we'll get started on that. So the goal is to first uh, construct the optimization model for the word movers distance, right? So first let's get started on how to embed words into uh, vectors, right? And for this, we use the famous uh, Google News word to vec data. And uh, this, uh, this has about 3 million words in the data set. And uh, yeah, when you first run the model, the loading of this Google News uh, data set takes a few minutes. So um, once you do that, you can query the vector embedding for each word. So for example, the word Sherlock has this 30, 300 dimensional vector embedding, right? So each dimension has some kind of feature that that's been uh, preloaded into this model. So all what we want to know is using the vector embeddings of every pair of words for two documents, what's the similar, like what's the distance between them? So that would be the input to our optimization model. And to create the two documents, I started with a sentence from the book, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, so the sentence goes, the little man uh, stood glancing from one to the other of us with half frightened, half hopeful eyes as one who is not sure whether he is on the verge of a windfall or of a cat catastrophe. So this is a fairly complicated sentence. And uh, I asked ChatGPT to give me an alternative sentence with, with similar semantic meaning. And it says, well, here's a sentence. With the gaze that shifted back and forth between us, the diminutive figure appeared to be a mixture of apprehension and anticipation, uncertain if he was on the cusp of a fortune or a disaster. If I looked at it, it's not obvious that it's plagiarized, right? So it's uh, so we'll see if the optimization model score helps us identify this. Yeah, so we add these two sentences to the model. So document one is a given the the given sentence in document two is the rewritten sentence with similar semantic meaning. Have a few other examples that you can play around with. So the first thing we'll do is we're gonna do a lot of pre-processing on this text, right? So uh, we, don't, we don't care about all the words in the text. So for example, we remove um, the, the pronouns, right? The proper nouns. And we can remove um, the stop words and the punctuation marks. Uh, so stop words are words like the, uh, like articles and stuff. So these are uh, words that don't really have a semantic, uh, they don't car carry semantic value to the kind of comparison we're making. So once you remove the prepositions um, and, uh, you know, the punctuations and stuff, our documents reduce to a smaller set of words. So it's called a bag of words, right? We're comparing two bags of words. And we can visualize these words for better understanding of what the words, what the two documents look like. So we have um, these basic set of words that we're comparing. So little um, man and stuff, these are, these are compared to the words um, on the other side, like diminutive, diminutive and little are close, right? So um, yeah. And yeah, so we basically find the cosine distance between every pair of words. Why cosine? So the idea is two word uh, word vectors embeddings are in the same direction. Then the idea is that they're semantically close, right? So we we use that um, word word embeddings to construct the distance matrix. And yeah, so we now model the problem of sending flow from one document to the other as an optimization model. So in this illustration, the sentence, Obama speaks to the media in Illinois and the president greets the press in Chicago. Um, so we, the idea is to send flow from each word in document one to each word in document two. And uh, we wanna send more flow between pairs of words that are 
uh, semantically similar, okay? So that is if their distance is small, uh, then we wanna send more flow, okay? So for example, here, Obama and president are semantically closer than Obama and greets, for example. So we send more flow there. Um, and these arrows show the optimal flow, okay? So how do we construct a model that ensures this? So first we define the decision variables, right? So uh, yeah, first we actually start with the Groby model. We say import Groby pi, create the model. And then we define the flow variables. So the idea here is there's a flow sent from each word in document one to document two. And this is any number between zero and one, right? It's a continuous variable. And when you have a model with continuous variables, this optimization model is called a, dis a linear program. As opposed to in the airline example, we had binary decision variables, in which case it's called an integer program. Yeah, so yeah, we have created the flow variables. The idea is to minimize the, the product of the distance and the flow. Remember, our goal is to send more flow to pair, pairs of words with smaller distance, right? So when you minimize this objective, the model naturally ensures that kind of relationship, right? So yeah, so we add this, so we already know how to add a more, uh, like an objective to um, to Groby model. We just say set objective and we uh, write this objective using for loops. There are, there's also other faster ways to write this, but for now, let's just use for loops to do so. Yeah, so we have added the decision variables in the objective and we need to have constraints, right? We, we cannot allow any kind of flow. So, the what what we want is every word to have equal representation in this flow right every word can send one unit of flow or more generally flow proportional to the frequency of occurrence of the word in the document right so we ensure that by these equalities so so from every word w in document one uh, the sum of all the flows from w to all the words in document two equals the frequency of uh, word W in document one. That is if uh, word W is more frequent, then we send flow proportional to its prevalence in document one. And yeah, we can add these constraints using the add constraints uh, function. And this is a more concise way of adding constraints here. Um, yeah, so essentially we've added the decision variables, objective function and the constraints, and we're ready to solve the model. So once you solve it, Groby says, okay, well, the dissimilarity is a 0.63, right? So, uh, I mean, it's not clear how to interpret this number, right? So is, is that high, is that low? It's not sure. And we also know the flow between every pair of words. And when sorted by distance, we can see that uh, words that are similar have a higher flow, right? Like the same words like us and us have the highest flow, verge and cup, cusp are the next more similar catastrophe, disaster, eyes, gaze, glancing gaze, and so on. So it's kind of sorted in that order. Um, but so the question is, um, how, how can we tell if something is truly plagiarized, right? So we take this model and what we're gonna do is compare this sentence with every sentence in the book. And we can check if uh, the model gives the lowest score to our original sentence. Right. So what we now do is we uh, we import the whole book with uh, 4,000 plus sentences, and we can do a pairwise comparison of all the sentences with the plagiarized text. And uh, yeah, so we functionize the whole model. So we put the whole model into a function, which takes as input two documents and outputs the dissimilarity score. Right. So and then we do the pairwise comparison for every sentence. Um, yeah, so we start with the plagiarized text once again. And um, yeah, when you run this model, you'll see that uh, it takes a few seconds for the model to um, do Paris comparisons and it compares with all of these other sentences. So this only prints whenever the dissimilarity improves, that is, goes down. And here we see that the, uh, the model does, in fact, give the smallest dissimilarity to the plagiarized text, the original text from which we plagiarize, right? So uh, you can try other texts as well. Feel free to play around with this and uh, let us know if you have any interesting uh, outputs that you get out of this. Um, 
But yeah, so this is just a simple starting point to, to communicate how one can model an abstract concept, right? So we're sending flow from words between words. Um, can you make this more complex? Possibly. Uh, for example, here, we only looked at semantics and uh, uh, similarity, and we ignored the order in which the words appear. So what if you want to incorporate the order of words? Can you extend this model to capture that as well? So these are some things that you can play around with and maybe encourage your students and colleagues to uh, try it out. So yeah, thanks for listening to this and over to you, Jerry. I am back. Thanks, Rahul, um, for that, uh, uh, for going through those uh, notebooks. Um, those are awesome examples, really fun, um, and really interesting applications of optimization. Um, so um, what I'm going to talk about now is if you did attend our, our first webinar um, where data meets decisions, um, Rahul uh, talked about an, in an interesting example that we came up with. Uh, a price optimization example um, for avocados. So what is the right price um, in order to sort of maximize revenue um, to uh, when, when selling avocados? So um, I'm going to do a quick recap of that example and then dive into um, how we're able to use a couple of new open source uh, Gurobi packages um, to make the uh, to further integrate machine learning um, into the optimization model. So um, again, a quick review of the original example is um, sort of posed to you is you supply avocados to the United States and you need to decide a couple of things. I need to decide on the avocado price. That's a uh, continuous uh, decision variable that we talked about before. Um, the amount to supply to each region, again, um, continuous. And to do that um, all while maximizing profit. So in the original example, uh, we created the relationship between price and demand um, using an ordinary least square model. And we essentially just fit that model and said, okay, well, here's the, the intercept, here's the, uh, here's the slope, and then sort of piece that together and put that into the optimization model as a constraint, just sort of using that. So we created constraints in sort of like the normal Garobi uh, uh, way, but we, we, we use those bits of information to, to do so. Um, again, we were formulating, and then once we sort of uh, had that regression model and, and everything, we added in all the other constraints and, and all of that stuff to, to formulate the optimization model. And again, that would find the best price and allocation for each region to, to maximize, uh, maximize our net revenue or profit. So that was, uh, that was what we did initially. So what's new in part two of this example? Well, um, again, like I mentioned, there are two um, sort of open source experimental packages that, um, that Groby released uh, somewhat recently. One is called uh, just Groby Machine Learning. And the, the goal of that package is to, to give you the ability to replace that, that uh, least squares model that we sort of Piece together in terms of cre in, to create the uh, constraint that represented the relationship between price and demand for avocados. Um, so now you're able to use a trained, uh, in this example, we're going to use a trained scikit-learn object, but um, you can use objects from other popular uh, um, uh, machine learning packages like um, TensorFlow and Keras and, and, and things like that. Um, and we'll have more information about, about that um, at the end of the webinar as well. Uh, so you're able to replace that, that sort of piece together relationship and, and actually just say, hey, take my trained uh, scikit-learn model and use that as a constraint. And, and all that's really needed to do that in addition to the, the trained model itself is just this function that's um, add predictor constraint, um, C-O-N-S-T-R there. So that's all it really takes. And so keep an eye out for that. And that's what I'm gonna highlight um, in a little bit. Uh, and we also used uh, or have this uh, new package for uh, Groby Pi Pandas that we use a little bit in, in the example that I'm going to go through. Um, and the purpose of, of using this package, particularly in this example, but overall, is it really helps you easily uh, create decision variables uh, using a pandas data frame, which is, you know, if, if you're working in, in Python um, in any type of data analytics capacity, 
one of the first two lines in any script that you write is going to be import pandas as PD. Um, whether or not it's above or below the NumPy one that you're going to use is, is up to you, but it's going to be one of those top two ones. So um, so we decided, you know, at Groby that, hey, we need to uh, make sure that we're that people are leveraging pandas and Groby Pi, which is our, our the name of our API, making sure that we're leveraged that they're leveraging these two packages together uh, properly. So we created uh, this uh, th this package that that sort of makes sure that that things are being done uh, properly and, and that you're getting the best performance. So, so you can use this package again to easily create the decision variables from a from a data frame, um, and then also the corresponding constraints. So it makes it very simple uh, to um, to take uh, information from a data frame and use that to create your model. Uh, the, the example that I that I'm going to uh, um, go over. Uh, it just offers a small glimpse of of the functionality. So there's a lot more that happens in Groby Pi Pandas that you can do, but um, I'm just going to show a little bit. And here we go. So this is part two of our um, price optimization with avocados. There's a lot of uh, text here that I'm going to sort of skip through. Um, again, if you're familiar with the problem from the previous webinar, uh, nothing's really changed. Um, and if you haven't looked at that yet, then take a minute, you know, after, after this webinar, take a minute to review that recording, uh, take a look at the previous example. It'll give you a lot of the um, important information that you need uh, in order to, to sort of get the whole of the problem. But um, so I'm going to skip here a little bit since we're getting a little bit later on time. Um, make sure we have some time for uh, questions as well, because I've seen a bunch of really cool questions pop up. So um, just I'm going to quick review some things that are important to this data, uh, to this problem, which first off is the data. Um, so this is essentially what the data set looks like. Um, we have uh, uh, date stamps, and then we have the unit sold, which is uh, the demand, and then the price in which uh, that that uh, that quantity was sold in that region for a particular year. The the time span that we have, um, and and also the month as well. Um, the the time span is 2015 through mid 2022, I believe. Um, and actually, if you want to keep updating this data, um, the Haas Avocado Board, which where, where we got this information from, they keep their records pretty up to date. So you can uh, keep going if you'd like. Um, we also added um, a variable that identified a peak versus off peak season, um, which we because um, we saw that in an in initial data analysis, which again, if you look at the first notebook, you'll see a lot more uh, data analysis, visualization, and things like that that are typical to a data science project, a data science process. Um, we saw we saw that that was um, an important factor for um, for a regression model in order to predict um, what the um, demand would be given price um, for a particular region, year, and time. So uh, here are our regions. Great Lakes, Mid-South, so on and so forth. I think there's uh, eight of them. So let's get right to the prediction part. Um, this is where a lot of uh, data scientists are gonna be like, okay, yep, this make you know this is a, a bit that makes sense. And when I was talking about parts of like expanding and experimenting, you know, we we put very simple um, predictive models here just so so we can be concise. Um, feel free to take the data and do what you want with it, add to it and do crazy fun things with it in order to it, it, to improve predictions. Um, the main focus of these is to is to incorporate um, uh, data science and, and, and prescriptive or predictive analytics with the prescriptive optimization that Garobi provides. So split our, you know, do our typical test train, splitting data, um, we do have a categorical uh, variable, so we do use some one-hot um, encoding for that. Uh, that's the region, and also scale um, price in year, and we fit. You know, typical typical uh, process here. We do use a pipeline to make sure that we do all the feature transformations for a. Uh, we're gonna for consistency. We're just um, and and to make a comparison, we're sort of just using linear regression again. But you can use other forms here as well. Although I will caution, if you do um, uh, work through this notebook, there is a size limitation for the problem. So it does pretty. It, um, it does kind of restrict the the models that you can use. Um, it, whether you want to use something like a random forest or decision tree or gradient boosting, um, it, it makes it difficult. So if you have an academic light, if, you, if you're in um, 
in academic space and you have your, uh, the ability to get a license, I would highly recommend that because then you have a little bit more fun to uh, to experiment with. So um, we again fit and then make sure that we sort of test to make, make sure that our model is doing a pretty nice job fitting. Again, you, a lot of cross-validation stuff here as well that you would, you would want to add and, and a lot of more robust um, uh, process to make your uh, prediction process more robust. Again, we're sort of here to combine the two, so we want to be concise. But here's our optimization model. Um, and just a quick um, uh, refresher on the parameters. Um, D is the predicted demand, so it's sort of the output of the uh, prediction model. B, capital B, is the overall number of avocados. We have costs for waste and transport. We're also putting bounds on the min and max of the price per avocado, and then mins and max um, on the uh, number of av avocados allocated per region. So we don't want to, you know, charge. You know, we don't, we don't want to give uh, charge too way, way, way too much for avocados. We want to make sure that we are sort of living within um, um, sort of reality. And the same thing for the amount that we want to allocate to individual region regions as well. So a lot of information is right here. Here's what the, the data sort of looks like in terms of transportation costs and, and the min and max delivery. Uh, I think at this point, we're saying that uh, an avocado can be free if we wanted it. That would make too much sense though. Um, but all the way up to $3, if that seems, you know, that's sort of the limits that we put. So we, Install um, Groby Pi Pandas, Groby Machine Learning, import that. Um, we do need to create a features data frame to, to sort of input, to sort of have that relationship between what are the features that were used in the prediction that we fit. And um, so we're creating that as well here. And then now we talk about, okay, you know, the decision variables. This is what I mentioned early on, and Rahul talked about for his examples as well. Um, we, we are deciding the price, which is P. Uh, X is the um, number of avocados supplied to a region. S is what is sold. So we, the, the X and S are very similar, but they're a little bit different. If if the demand is less than the total that we can supply, there's going to be a little bit of waste happening. So th that's going to help us sort of keep track of that, which is variable W as well, which is the predicted predicted number of avocados that are wasted. And then D is the predicted demand. So these are all decision variables for us. And you can sort of print out one of the variables and see see what uh, what it looks like in terms of a uh, when uh, once you sort of uh, Im import these variables and add them to uh, to the model. Which again, so you sort of saw how things were added to models in in Rahul's examples as well. Adding variables in using um, Groby Pi Pandas is very easy. So if you look at this this line here, we want to add p price to our model M, which we defined earlier. We're using a data frame called data that uh, I sort of probably scrolled by a little bit too quickly, but it had columns for the price and the min delivery, um, things like that. So we use the actual name of the 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 uh, uh, the column in the in the data frame. Same for the decision variable down here X. Um, where we're setting lower bounds and upper bounds for min delivery and max delivery as well. So we're using the information straight from the from the data frame, um, data frame columns. So here's a constraint for our total supply. These are all the same constraints. I'm going to sort of skip through these because we're getting close on time. Again, review the, the notebook um, at your leisure. And I'm going to stick here because here is the new... Um, uh, constraint that add, that adds the regression model directly to the optimization model. And it's just this simple uh, couple lines here, really just the one line, but you also want to get a little bit of information about the um, uh, constraints you just added. So it's add predictor constraint, see our constrictor, <laughs> um, to our model M using our, our, our scikit-learn object reg, which we defined earlier, um, and then using the features that, that we use to predict. And we're going to Add that as you know using a uh, variable d, so that is um, that's all it takes <laughs> um, to relate the features to the um, to the uh, um, uh, decision variable d. You do want to take a look at the stats because you want to when you do this, it does add variables and constraints sort of behind the scenes um, to your optimization model, and you want to make sure that um, that you maybe want to keep that in 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 check. Um, if if you need to, so this is just saying the number of variables that you add and the number of of um, uh, or the number of variables and and what types they are. 
here's our objective same as as the last example so then um actually then you again fire up the solver it this solves um in 0, 0.00 seconds so extremely fast um and you're able to incorporate your your regression model that fast so um and the the last bit of information that i want to talk about in terms of the groby pi pandas package is all right you you set up all of this stuff with um uh you know using pandas data frames can you extract the solution to data frames certainly so we uh create a, a, a essentially a blank data frame to indexed by the regions and then we pull price the amount allocated what was sold what was wasted what was the predicted demand just by using the corresponding decision variable that we defined earlier and then doing the uh, p dot gppd you know saying that this is our decision variable hey let's let's fire up the package here to to uh extract the variable and then the the value is just this capital x um so you can see that based off of the in, the input um that we gave here we were able to get a net revenue of 41 almost 41.9 million and we can see exactly what was allocated what was sold and where the waste would be um occurring so you can sort of get a whole whole view of what's going on so um and then also with some of these models um that that you can use as part of the uh, machine learning package there is some approximation that needs to happen sometimes so um, it is important to understand what the error will look like so you can print that out as well um, again there's a lot more information about the groby pi pandas package and the groby machine learning package um, that uh, that you can get particularly through a couple webinars that we hosted uh, i believe at the either at earlier this year um, so we'll send links out to that as well um, I think that is it for me for now. So I will stop sharing and send it back over to Lindsay for a quick wrap up. Thanks so much. So for the sake of time, we have just three minutes left of the core webinar. Uh, I traditionally would go over a few of the items available to academics and a review of the academic community and how we support them. I'm actually going to email this information out to follow. Uh, just a very high level note, I put links in the chat so you can either start your journey with a free academic full featured license. If you're on the commercial side or a practitioner, I did link to the, the free trial license as well. And one last thing that I wanted to highlight, which might be of interest to all attendees here today, uh, Jerry and uh, one of our partners put together a full two-day training. It's about nine hours in total. It is Optimization 101 for Data Scientists. So if you're interested in what you heard today and you want a little bit more and a robust way to get started with optimization, please check this out. I did pop the link in the chat for this. Registration's open through mid-June and the content will be available fully self-paced and on demand through September 1st. So again, a great way to get started with optimization if uh, you're interested in what we covered today and want a little bit more. So thank you for joining us. A special thank you to Rahul and Jerry we can stay for an extra 10 minutes or so. So if you want to stay with us and ask questions, we are very happy to extend this session for Q&A. If you do have to roll off at the top of the hour, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. We got through a lot of the questions during the session, but feel free to stay and interact with us a bit more. Cool. Uh, thanks, Lindsay. Um, so yeah, th there was a couple questions that popped up that um, I think I'd like to take a stab at right now. And then um i may call on a, some of my colleagues um for some other ones as well so um the one uh, one question um is about the from the uh, flight scheduling problem it says um the mathematical optimization model was built sort of on historical data um there's no machine learning or anything that was used at this uh, um we didn't go over anything about machine learning something like time series or anything like that just wondering how we can leverage uh machine learning um or deep learning to handle more complex scenarios um, essentially, the, uh, the the main parameter that that Rahul was using was the the proportion of flights that are disrupted, um, and that is you know just one number that can come from a whole bunch of data, you know. So you can have a lot of weather information um, and a, a lot of other models that may come come together that can come from machine learning, deep learning that will help you produce that that um, that individual number. Um, Rahul, is there anything else you want to add to to that? 
Uh, no, that's that's exactly right. So the level of disruption here was an illustration of one component in which you can use to uh, leverage to add a prediction element to it. Uh, there are a lot of, in, in reality, there are a lot of nuances to each setting that we don't look at right now. For example, uh, maybe there's only disruption in certain time windows, right? Um, so maybe how, how can you restrict the model to that? Uh, maybe some, only some airports have disruption. So every situation is different. And that's kind of like why we left the problem in a general sense. But uh, the general idea is that the parameters of the model can be can come from any prediction model. So that's that's what what we uh, what we want to highlight. And um, uh, one question that, that I think could be a clearing point for your other example, Rahul, is um, when you were running the optimization sort of um, uh, through all of this, these sentences, was that just one big optimization model or is it running uh, iteratively and it, was, it would run a bunch of optimization models and, and looping through that? It's a great question. So we are running a bunch of optimization models. And why are we able to do that? It's because each... Uh, model, e each time the model is run for a sentence, it takes, uh, I think, 20 milliseconds on my laptop. So, so there are different ways to go about this. So you could either construct a big optimization model that uh, looks at all sentences. Um, so that would be one big optimization model versus a more decomposed approach, right? So we take the latter approach. Um, yeah, I mean, the only limit was that the free version of Groby has a size limit, the 2000 variables by 2000 constraints. Um, if you want to run a larger optimization model, the, the Groby license is available for free for academics, or you can use a commercial Groby license to run a optim bigger optimization model. Yeah. Cool. Um, and uh, one question um, from uh, Mahabin for, for, for you, Rahul, I think would be good for you to answer is, um, what are your suggestions for coping with a huge number of optimization variables um, in the text-to-learning text problem um, in a real world setting? So essentially, do you see that there would be a huge difference between what you uh, what the notebook says versus something that you may wanna put in like a production or, or a, a larger real, real world problem? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one. So the nice thing is that this model is uh, has a nice structure to it. So you're minimizing an objective, um, a flow objective, the, and then we just have two constraints. Uh, and uh, so some optimization models have what's called a nice structure, meaning uh, even for large data sets, it still solves pretty fast. Um, but in a more general sense, if your problem is um, hard to solve, that is, it doesn't have a nice structure, then there are some pre-processing stages you can uh, use to reduce the data set. So for example, we instead of comparing with all pairs of words, maybe we just, we only look at uh, words that are pre-processed to be similar to begin with, right? We don't have to compare all pairs of words, right? So, uh, so that is one quick way to reduce the size of the problem, just, just to look at the top 2000 pairs of words. Um, yeah, so that that would fix it. Good. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a that's a very good sort of idea for op, for optimization modeling in general. Is is you can do a lot of pre processing to to figure out you know what what would make, even make sense to help instead of having every possible combination of of you know of like decision for decision variables, you can do some pre processing to sort of weed out things that are are obviously not going to be uh, mm -hmm. uh, good or useful for your problem. Uh, so, I want to add one more thing. Um, mm -hmm. Groby has a whole uh, host of uh, parameters that you can tune, uh, hyperparameters that you can tune to make the model faster. Uh, and Groby also has a hyperparameter tuning um, function where it, the algorithm's parameters can be um, effectively um, set so that the problem runs faster. So if you as a data scientist have like, let's say one week of time to perfect the model, then you can spend a couple of days modeling it and the next few days uh, tuning the problem to mm -hmm. uh, get the fastest solution time out of it. So you might factor that in into your model building and implementation uh, stages of your optimization setup. Yeah, yeah. awesome, yeah. Um, so uh, another question is, uh, can we create a model that uses uh, Groby, uh, the pandas variables that I was talking about mixed with traditional 
grow B variables? And the answer to that is yes. You don't need to uh, worry about it. Um, you can you can sort of mix and match um, as well. So it, it's not just one nor the other. Uh, let's see. Um, so we use, uh, let's see, another question here is, uh, you used uh, Colab notebooks here, but is it possible to integrate Groby models in something like Databricks, for example? Um, that is something that, um, uh, in, in doing that in an example, uh, that is something that um, I definitely am super interested in in doing. So if you stay tuned with us, sort of, uh, you know, keep tabs, um, we'll be coming out with more examples that will be working in those types of platforms um, because uh, we, we understand that that uh, platforms like Databricks and and similar things um, are super popular, are very useful, um, and that's where a lot of data scientists work. So um, we have experience um, on our technical team working with those, uh, working with Groby in in those environments. And um, we want to get the word out that, you know, if that's where you work as well, then then you can still use um, Groby uh, in for your optimization models that would that, that could really integrate well with the, you know, the um, machine learning models that you build in the, in those platforms. Uh, let's see other good questions. There's a lot of good questions. <laughs> um, about that right. one done. If, if there's one that you want to answer, we'll go for it. Yes, yeah, someone has to follow up about parameter tuning. So I've dropped a link in the chat. Um, you can um, learn more about. There was another question on maximizing flow versus minimizing the flow. That's a good question. Uh, yeah, these are things you can try out. So uh, in our problem, we're minimizing the flow. And in doing so, what we're saying is we want to send flow between words that are most similar, that is the smallest distance, right? Um, and the overall score would be the measure of, okay, despite sending flow between the smallest pair of words, what is the net distance? So that would be a measure of dissimilarity. It makes sense, right? So when you're maximizing flow, on the other hand, what would happen is you're, you'll end up sending flow to the most dissimilar words, like eyes and uh, car, right? So we don't want to do that, right? So uh, yeah, so minimizing and maximizing achieves the opposite goals of what we're trying to do. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, so uh, let's see how much time we got left. A couple more minutes, maybe. Um, so uh, with a question with respect to the Groby Pi interface, um, when it comes to applying Groby to very large and complex problems, is there any limitation to the that the Python interface has? Um, are we making any trade-offs um, for the convenience of Python? Um, very much in general, I'd say, no, that's not that, that's not the case. Um, I mean, there are other languages that would sort of essentially the what that question is 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 referring to is you know the time that it takes to build the model um, before before it actually before Garobi actually starts solving it. That's that that's the important part there. Um, there are other languages that would do that faster. So if you are in super need of, of every millisecond, then, then maybe you can experiment with that. Um, but by and large, it's probably not gonna be much of an issue for you. Um, but uh, again, you know, if you do, and there are applications where, you know, you need every, you need to be absolutely as quick as possible. So then if you do think that, that it's taking too long to compile the model and, and sort of build it before it solves, then um, then then you may want to look at other options um, for using Groby because and and we do offer you know uh, other APIs as well to uh, to build to uh, to build your models. So, um, but again, by and large, probably not going to be a big issue. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, maybe this is a question, Lindsay, you can handle. Um, so where can I sign up for grow before data science sessions? Is there a mailing list they can get added to? Absolutely. So if you're on our academic mailing list or our general mailing list, we try to send these notifications to the whole population of users within Grobi. Also, a great place to track is our events page on the Grobi.com website and also LinkedIn and or uh, Twitter if you're a user of either of those platforms. So we will advertise in all of those spaces. 
We'd love for you to join future data science focused events. All right, uh, okay. I, think that, yeah, I think that puts us at time. Um, we, yeah. we'll, we'll try and answer a few more questions in, in text real fast, but uh, I think that's about it for us. Thank you all for joining. When I end the webinar, there will be a survey that pops up. We'd love to hear your feedback. It helps us modify future events and create content that is useful to our users. So many thanks again. Keep an eye out for future events like this one and uh, stay tuned for the next academic webinar series event. Have a great one.